Well, this evening we're returning again to Jesus' high priestly prayer. And what I'd like to do is read the portion we're going to be looking at this evening, verses 20 through 23, where Jesus prays that we might experience unity, uh, oneness, oneness of heart, oneness of purpose uh, in His kingdom. Uh, let's begin our reading in verse uh, 20, and as I've said, I'll read through verse 23. Jesus says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this evening. Now, as I already reminded you this morning, Jesus, we saw Jesus praying for us that the Father would make us holy, that He would sanctify us, that He would purify us from sin and that particular fruit of sin, selfishness, because the Lord was sending us to the world to tell others of His saving love in the gospel. If we were not purified from our sins, the world would be too tempting and we would be neutralized. And if our selfishness was not broken, we really wouldn't want to go. We wouldn't want to move out of our comfort zones. And so the Lord prayed that we might be sanctified, that He might send us. But we also saw that Jesus' prayer doesn't automatically sanctify us. It's not something that happens without effort on our part. Now, His prayer... And his personal sanctification gave power to the means by which we would be sanctified, the means that the Father has given us to this end, but we need to use these means. We need to be in the Word. We need to read it. We need to seek to understand it. We need to apply it and live according to this Word. Uh, Paul reminds Timothy how all Scripture is inspired and profitable to this end. But if it's just simply resting in this book and not getting into our minds and hearts, it's not really going to do us any good. We need to read it. We need to study it. We need to apply it. But we also need to use the other ways that the Lord has appointed us or appointed to give us more of His Holy Spirit, and that would include all the means of grace. We need to pray. We need to worship one of the reasons why we're here this evening, to fellowship, another reason why the Lord calls us together. We need to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We need to celebrate it often, which is why we do celebrate it often every uh, Lord's Day morning. We need to do these things if we are to have the strength that we need effectively to reach others with the gospel, those who are lost and are going to go down into hell unless the Lord saves them. And the only way He does it is through the gospel, and the only way that He communicates the gospel is through His people. Now, this evening we see that our Lord prayed this, this for our sanctification, not only that we might have the strength to move out of our comfort zones and to evangelize, and to be able to do this without being stumbled by the world, but He also prayed because He was concerned about the character of our witness. He wants us, besides going out and doing this work, He wants us to be in, in our nature, in our character, in the things that we show others. He wants us to be living proof that He was sent by His Father into this world and that He has sent us into the world. And He wants us uh, to offer as proof our unity as the body of Christ. Now that's, again, a pretty tall order because uh, we don't see a lot of unity today, but we need to seek for more of it so that Jesus might have this witness that He desires. 
So this evening, I want us to consider basically four things and then have an application. The four things that Jesus, first of all, His prayer was not just for His disciples, but for all believers. Secondly, that His prayer specifically is that we would all be one, and we're going to want to understand what that means. Uh, thirdly, what Jesus has given us so that we all could be and all would be one. And then fourthly, why Jesus prays that we might be one. And then, as I said, we'll close with some ways that we can seek after this unity that Jesus desires from us. Now, first of all, we see that Jesus prays for all believers, all believers present that were present in His day and all those who would believe in the future. He says in verse 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. Now, there's no doubt that Jesus was praying for his disciples when he lifted up this prayer. He was praying in their hearing. He, he was praying specifically for them. But we also need to understand that he was praying for those who had believed through his word that were currently believing and those who would believe. Now, even though uh, the present tense is used in this passage where he says, also for those who believe in me, uh, Jesus is referring here to all who ever will believe in him. Uh, there's different uses of, of the present tense in the original language, and sometimes the, the author, the writer, the speaker refers to, uh, in using the present tense, refers to something that is so certain to take place that he represents it as something that is already taking place. Uh, there are various terms for, for that particular use of the present tense, but the idea is that it is used in this way. Now, Jesus knew that there were others that the Father had given to him. Others that would believe, obviously, not just that handful of believers that he was praying for at that time, but there were many sheep he had yet to gather into the kingdom. There were others also who had already believed that weren't present at that last meal. Jesus prays for them as well as his disciples. He prays for us as well in this prayer as we've seen. If we are believing in him, if we are following him. So Jesus prays for all of his people. Now, secondly, Jesus prays that we would all be one. He says in verse 21, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, let me just mention this as we... Um, as we look at this idea of oneness, I mean, there's a lot of different things that that can mean. And certainly one thing it means is that one day we're going to be with our Lord in glory together as one, as one body, as one perfected people. We're going to be in the new heavens and the new earth. We're going to share a perfect love with the Father and the Son and they with us by the Holy Spirit. We're all going to be united. But that's not exactly what he's referring to here. And again, I would just point out that Jesus prays that we would be one so that the world may believe that you sent me. He's talking about a oneness that applies to our lives here and now so that we would be able to present a witness to the world. Now, that's a later point, but I just wanted to bring that up now so as we look at the fact that Jesus is praying that we would be one, we might have a better idea of what he has in mind here. Now, he prays that we might have a oneness that we might have a unity that is basically the same as what the Father shares with the Son and that the Son shares with the Father, that we might share this oneness, this unity with each other and ultimately share it with the Father and the Son. Now, this has been taken in different ways in the history of the church and one thing we need to avoid is something that I'm sure that, that, that none of us believe here. But again, some cults have actually taken it this way. That Jesus is actually praying that we would become one with the Father and the Son in the sense that we would be basically one, become one in being with them, with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that essentially we would become part 
of the Godhead. You know, there's actually a group that believes that, or at least used to, and some still cling to it. It's called the Worldwide Church of God that believes that, that the Godhead is, is not just a trinity, but it's basically a family, and everybody who believes becomes a part of that Godhead and essentially becomes deity along with God. It's amazing what people will believe. I mean, the Mormons believe that we can work our way to godhood and actually become gods and we can become creators and we can create our whole world and that God Himself used to be a man. The Bible doesn't teach any such thing. God has always been God. He always will be God. He cannot change and God cannot, even if God wanted to, which of course He would never want to, but He could not bring us into the Godhead in that sense. God cannot make us into gods. That would be an impossibility, not to mention a blasphemous idea. Well, Jesus wasn't praying for that. Jesus was praying that would be, we would be one in another sense, that we would be one in heart, and that we would be one in purpose, that we would basically have the same love for one another and the same concern for one another that the Father has for the Son. The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father. Uh, Jesus prays that we would have that kind of love for one another, and that we would have that love for the Father and the Son, and that they would have, of course, they have that love for us. Remember what Jesus commanded His disciples in John 13, verse 34. He said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. You know, it's interesting that the Christian faith is essentially a religion of love that's behind everything that the Lord is doing. The reason why He sent His Son into the world was to turn us away from our hatred and to cause us to love in order that we might love one another, in order that we might love our neighbor, in order that we might love God and again be loved by God. Love is the goal behind it. And Jesus here is praying that we would have this love for one another, that we would love one another again, even as the Father and the Son share this love amongst themselves. Now, we're going to see again even a closer connection uh, and a, a, a greater similarity of that love as we consider the third point. But I just wanted to mention there's another sense in which the Lord prayed that we would be united in a way that is also how the, the Godhead is united, and that is that we would be united in one purpose, that we would have one goal or one objective, even as the Father and the Son share one purpose, and that purpose is His glory in the salvation of His people. Now think about what Jesus has been asking for throughout this prayer. He prayed that the Father would glorify the Son, that He would give Him the strength to carry out the work of redemption. He prayed that so that the Son would be able to glorify Him, that He would be able to bring many sons to glory. Jesus also prayed that these sons that the Father had given Him might glorify Him by bringing the gospel to others so that they too might know Him and give glory to Him by doing precisely the same thing. In essence, Jesus prays not only that we would have one heart towards one another, the same love and care and concern for one another as members of the same body, but that together we might have one purpose as well. These would be the two things that would unite us, would be our love for one another and our shared common purpose, which is to give glory to God in the furtherance of His kingdom, in the proclamation of His gospel. Now, third, Jesus has given us His Spirit so that we might um, have this love and this purpose. Jesus prays in verse 22, "'The glory which you have given me I have given to them that they may be one just as we are.'" Uh, what is it that Jesus has done in order to ensure that His body would have the same love and care for one another and would be united in this one purpose? Well, He says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them so that they may 
be one. Now, what is Jesus talking about here? Well, Jesus earlier prayed that the Father would glorify him with the glory which he had with him before the world was, that he would bestow upon his human nature as the God-man something of that divine glory which he had from all eternity. Jesus is not asking that the Father would give us that because we can't have divine glory. For one thing, Jesus did not possess that glory yet. This is something he would receive when he was exalted. And of course, even if he did have this, he wouldn't give it to us because this is glory that belongs to God alone. But there is a glory that Jesus actually did possess that he had given to his disciples in some measure, which is what caused them to follow him in the first place, and that he was yet to pour out upon them in, in a greater way, and that is the glory of his spirit. The spirit is the spirit of glory. He is the one who could make them and make us one in heart and one in purpose, even as he and the Father are one. The Spirit of God has been called basically the, the Spirit of love in Scripture. That is the fruit, the, the primary fruit that He actually produces in the lives of those who possess Him. And if we had the time, we could look at that passage that talks about the fruits of the Spirit, and we could see how each one of those is actually a different way in which love is, is revealed in the hearts of those who have it. The Spirit of God is the love of God, and that is what... Jesus gives to us so that we may be one in our love for one another and one in our desire to give glory to the one whom we love most of all, again, by the spirit of love. Now, as the high priest, as we saw in Psalm 133, was anointed with oil as a symbol of the spirit of God who would give him the power that he needed in order to execute his office, in order to serve God in that particular calling. So Jesus was anointed, we are told in John chapter 3, with the Spirit above measure to do what the Father had called him to do. And as that oil ran down from the head of Aaron, down his beard and down to the edges of his robe, even so Jesus received the Spirit that he might give him to his people in order that we might be one, even as he and the Father are one. The Spirit of God is what basically is the love of God that binds the Father and the Son together in love, and that is the Spirit, or that is what he gives to us so that we may love one another with the same kind of love that the Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father. That is the divine nature that Peter says that we have become the partakers of. That's the kind of love that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13. That, that love which he says will never pass away but endures forever. And that is what binds us together in heart and in purpose. Now finally, we see why Jesus prays that we would be one. He says in verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, notice, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Now, Jesus prays that we might be filled with the Spirit, that we might have one love for one another, that we might be united in love and purpose so that the world would have a witness that this would be the proof that the gospel is true, that the Father really did send His Son into the world that He might save those who believe, and that He really does love those who take hold of His Son by faith, and He receives them into His family as sons and daughters. Now, God has given several witnesses to His truth, the witness of His, of his existence in nature, you know, Paul reminds us in Romans 1, as we've been reminded on several occasions, that his invisible attributes and his divine power are clearly seen in the creation and are understood through what he has been made or through what he made, so that everyone is without excuse. 
God has given a witness of his standard, his moral standard through conscience. Everyone has an understanding of what God requires. God has given us a clearer revelation of himself through his word, of his holiness through his law, and of his love and his mercy through the gospel, which are contained in scripture. But there is one more witness to the truth of all these things that the Father has given to the world, and that is how the gospel changes the lives of those who actually believe it. It has the ability to transform us from what people are like in the world, which again, read the newspaper, and you'll see what they're like. It transforms us from those who hate one another and who injure one another, and even kill one another, to those who love one another and would actually lay down our lives for one another. It transforms us from those who seek the things of this world, who desire just again fame and fortune, to those who seek that world which is coming. And that we do that not just for ourselves, but also for others. Now again, we were reminded earlier that our Lord Jesus commanded his disciples to love one another as he loved them. And he gives to them the reason why he wanted them to do that. And it basically follows along with what he tells us here. He says in John 13, verse 35, By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So our Lord Jesus Christ is praying for his church that we might be one in, in, in love for one another, we be bound together in love, have this, this self-sacrificing love for one another, and that we would be one in purpose, that we would take this message of God's love to others, that they also may be a part of the family of God in order that the world may have a witness. He's given us His Spirit so that we would have that love, but that we might actually give the world this additional witness of His truth. And this is perhaps the primary way that the Lord actually intends to um, prove to others that His gospel is, in fact, true. Now, since this is the evidence that God desires to reveal His truth, we can see how important it is that we have this unity of love and that we have this unity of purpose. And it's also easy to see why Satan spends so much time attacking this very thing. Uh, one thing that uh, surprised me, maybe it shouldn't have surprised me when I entered into the ministry and uh, began dealing perhaps more closely with, you know, brothers and sisters in the Lord was just how easily Christians become offended at one another and separate from one another and refuse to be reconciled to one another. It, it's, it's amazing particularly in light of the fact that uh, our Lord calls us to love one another and to do everything we can to preserve that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace and in love. He's given us His Spirit to be able to do this. I, I talked to one minister one time who was near retirement age at the time. This is like 20 years ago or maybe, well, maybe about 10 or 12 years ago. And there was a situation where there was uh, somebody who had come to our church who was... Um, well, it was at odds with somebody who was in his church, and I said, we need to do what we can to try to reconcile these. And he said, after being in the ministry for 40 years, let me just tell you, forget it. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I, I, I thought, well, why not? And he says, well, that's just the way it works out. He said, I don't even try it anymore. It, it, it's, it's sad, but, but that is the situation oftentimes in the church. And I think the history of the church bears this out. I'm not saying that he was right. You know, we should try to reconcile brethren wherever we can. But the sad news, you know, the sad fact is that that happens a lot. Again, consider how many denominations exist today. Satan has done a very good job of destroying the very witness that Jesus desired and prayed for in this prayer. Now, when the world looks at the church, what is the, what is the first thing that they tend to attack it's the fact that the church is fragmented into so many different groups and that they just can't seem to get along with each other. You know, the fact, um, I, I should say that that fact is undoubtedly one of the reasons, maybe of several reasons, why John Frame 
one of my professors in seminary, wrote a book for which he actually uh, was highly criticized called Evangelical Reunion where he expressed his own personal conviction that the way we need to deal with this issue is not to continue to remain separate from one another as, as Christian denominations, but rather that the whole body of Christ should come together as one body and then basically try to work out the differences together instead of remaining as a fragmented body which it continually argues against the truth of the gospel. And I think we'd have to admit, though that particular procedure may be fraught with a lot of difficulties, that he's right. This is what Jesus actually prays for his church, that we would all come together. But since the church isn't at this point, what can we do about it now? How can Jesus' prayer be realized and what can we do to help it? Should we just simply stand back and wait for this prayer to be answered? Or is there something that we can do and perhaps something we should be doing? Well, one thing we can do, of course, is pray. We need to pray that the Lord would bring the church together. We need to pray, I think even beyond that, we need to pray for a supernatural work of God because this has been going on for quite some time. We need to pray for revival that which we've been studying on Wednesday evenings. In revival, we see the fruits of the Spirit more powerfully uh, exhibited, more extensively poured out, and the Spirit of God is what we need in order to bring the church together. When Christians have more of the Spirit, it makes us love one another more than we would, of course, without the Spirit. We wouldn't love each other at all. So the more we have of the Spirit, the more we will love one another as Christians and the more we will want to unite. So we need to pray for revival. We need to pray that God would pour out of His Holy Spirit. Another thing that we can do is not be a part of the problem by saying and doing things to other believers that divide us from other believers rather than unite us to other believers. I mean, what do we do when we meet with other Christians but begin to argue doctrine? You know, we need to be careful. Instead of widening the gap that exists between us by pointing out the areas where we differ, instead to narrow that gap by focusing on the things that actually we share in common with one another, that bind us together. Let me ask you this question. If somebody belongs to another Christian denomination and they're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and they believe the fundamentals of the faith and they're saved by the grace of Christ, are they going to heaven? Of course they're going to heaven. Everybody who trusts in Jesus is going to heaven. We're going to be spending eternity with these brothers and sisters. We are called by the Lord to be one with them, to love them, and to be one not only in our love for one another, but also in purpose. So we need to be careful that we don't throw a wall or a barrier between us and divide, uh, you know, divide, uh, well, divide from them. We need to, to do what we can to try to unite with them. I think Walter Craddock was undoubtedly right when he writes this, and this quote is in, in your bulletin. He says, when I have communion with a saint, I must not look so much whether he be of such an opinion or whether he has taken the covenant or has been baptized once or twice or ten times, but see if he has fellowship with the Father and with Jesus Christ. You know, uh, you're probably uh, aware of this. Uh, back when the, uh, the church was united in one church. There was a time when that actually happened, although there were a lot of varying beliefs. There was one church. Uh, this was before the Protestant Reformation. This is basically, well, again, just, just one church. That church split into two churches over a couple of issues that we look at today and we kind of laugh. Whether the clergy should have a beard or not have a beard. <laughs> what day we should celebrate Easter. Uh, whether the clergy should be celibate or not, okay? These were things that the church divided over and it just split east from west. And of course, the Protestant Reformation brought about even a, another split, but that was a very important one. That had to do with the gospel. And that's one that was necessary. Sometimes it is necessary. But 
Are you baptized forward or backwards? Three times forward, three times backward, once forward, once backwards, sprinkling, pouring. Uh, should we divide over issues like this? Should we divide over trivial things? Uh, again, they all have some significance. I'm not saying they're not important. But how do we deal with that? Now, Jeremiah Burroughs also wrote this very helpful comment. He said this, Articles or rules for doctrine or practice in matters of religion to be imposed upon men should be as few as may be. There is very great danger in the unnecessary multiplying them. This in all ages has caused division and exceeding disturbances in the churches of Christ. Uh, I think the church is bound together by a certain core of beliefs that all have to do with the gospel itself and not even the secondary or perhaps third level issues. But do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you trusting Him? Are you repenting of your sins? Do you believe in the biblical Jesus? Um, and are you trusting Him alone for your salvation? It, it's really quite simple. Now, the difficulty comes when we run into believers that hold, again, things that, that are different than what we hold to and things that we believe are dishonoring to our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, every area that we vary from the truth in some, to some degree is dishonoring to the Lord. We have to recognize that it does make a difference what we believe. I'm not saying it doesn't, okay? But again, focusing, what I'm saying here is focusing what we share on what we share in common does not mean that we don't address these things that are dishonoring to the Lord or that ultimately will be harmful to other believers. But it means that we do so from the standpoint that we are family and not enemies. We don't kick them out of the church or basically write them out of the kingdom because they don't believe what we believe and separate fellowship because they don't want to do exactly the, the things that, that we do. We do need to love and we need to receive them, even as our Lord would love and receive them. If Jesus receives them, if He loves them, we need to love them, and we need to receive them. We need to do what Jesus would do if He was standing in our place. And then, of course, having received them, as we become aware of things that they believe that may be harmful to them, we need patiently in love to seek to bring them to the truth as members of the same family. Again, I think the tendency sometimes is you believe this, well, I, you know, I can't have fellowship with you, so I'm not going to bother. We, we can't have that kind of an attitude. So though it may be a while before the church actually becomes one, let's at least love other believers and let's show that unity. Let's work together to try to advance God's kingdom where we can work. Sometimes we can't. I mean, that happens too. Sometimes people do things that maybe we can't agree with, but where we can work together. Let's try to work together. Let's try to show the world a united front so that Jesus will have the witness that He wants, the witness that He prayed for, so that the world would believe that the Father sent Him into the world and that He, had loved, that he had loves us even as He loves His Son. May the Lord give us grace to take that to heart and to do what we can to promote unity rather than division. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.